This is just going to be a short video to teach you a bit about unit analysis. I will eventually do a video on magnets, I promise, but first we need to take a few steps back and do a bit of work. Unit analysis is one of the most important and undertaught parts of the language of theoretical physics. If you want to understand physics, you must understand unit analysis. I cannot overemphasize that. Equations can lie, but unit analysis does not lie. The best way to find a mistake in someone's equation is to look at the unit analysis. If the units don't add up, if the units don't balance, then there's something wrong with the equation. Even with correct unit analysis, even when the units completely add up, there can still be mistakes in interpretation. This video assumes that you have some understanding of what unit analysis is and what it is for. But if you don't, don't worry. By the time you are done with this video, you will. Every equation in theoretical physics has a hidden unit section. It's not always hidden, but it usually is. For example, the units of the famous energy equation, E equals mc squared, has the following unit section. These are the units of energy, often referred to as the joule. However, I prefer to write it like this. Writing it this way disambiguates the units. It makes them easier to read. They are also easier to write in the comment section of my YouTube video, but mostly it disambiguates the units and makes them easier to read. All of the unit analysis that I'm going to show you in this video will be of this form. By convention, I always put square brackets around my unit analysis. This way, you can tell the difference between what is equation and what is unit analysis. So whenever you see square brackets, think unit analysis. Here are the three base units that I, I will be using in this video. The second is the unit of the domain of time. The meter is the unit of the domain of space. The kilogram is the unit of the domain of matter. Notice that I call it the domain of matter and not the domain of mass. This is because mass is not a domain. Mass is a quantity of matter and so matter is the domain, not mass. This is the beauty of using the word domain instead of dimension. Time is not a dimension, it's a domain. Space is a domain. Matter is its own domain. So these are the domains that we are going to be focusing on primarily in this video. There is one more base unit that I didn't show here, and that is the unit called the Coulomb. The Coulomb is the unit of charge. But what is charge? Charge is elusive. Charge is different. Does charge even have its own domain? Or is it a derived unit? Can it be derived from the above base units? That is a good question. The kilogram is the unit of the domain of matter. Matter is a form of inertia. I call matter primordial inertia. The kilogram is the units of primordial inertia, or stillness inertia. As you will see, all the units of inertia contain this unit. I would refer to the unit 1 over s as the unit of change. I call this primordial loss of inertia, or primordial change. In the standard language, the unit 1 over s is the unit of frequency, or hertz but I generalize it to the units of change. 1 over s are the units of change. Change per second. Change per unit time. Change can only happen over time. This is why time is on the bottom. 1 over s are the units of change per unit time. 1 is the unit of change and s is the unit of time. One is just a placeholder for something that is going to change. So now I'm going to teach you unit analysis 
and I'm going to do it using the creation story that I like to use. In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia or change. Change necessitates the creation and or existence of space. And now we have the units of momentum. P in this case is short form for the units of momentum. Momentum, of course, is another form of inertia. An object in motion remains in motion. Momentum, P, becomes the new inertia. In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia, or change. Change necessitates the creation and or existence of space. And now we have the units of energy. J, of course, are the units of energy or joule. Energy is another form of inertia. In the beginning was inertia. And God said, let there be loss of inertia or change. Change necessitates the creation and or existence of space. And now we have the units of, and now we have the units of, of what? Whatever this is, you can be sure that it is another form of inertia, just like energy, just like momentum. But what is this? Does this have any physical meaning, like energy and momentum? When you group the units like this, or if you prefer, like this, then you find something very interesting. The units on the left are the units of volumetric flow. The units on the right are the units of surface tension. In other words, whatever these are the units of has something to do with a fluid of some kind. These, I believe, are the units of the fluid ether. These are the units of the inertial component of the fluid ether. Ether becomes the new inertia. The fluid ether becomes the new inertia. So hopefully those YouTube comments I made about unit analysis make more sense. In case you missed it, it goes something like this. The universe is always sloshing between inertia and loss of inertia. These are the units of primordial inertia. These are the units of primordial change. These are the units of momentum. Momentum is a form of inertia. These are the units of force. Force is loss of inertia. These are the units of energy. Energy is a form of inertia. These are the units of power. Power is loss of inertia. And finally, these are the units of the inertial component of the fluid ether. See the pattern? So what comes next? In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia. Loss of inertia necessitates the creation of space. 